Welcome to Westmont's Compelling Conversations. I'm Gail D. Beebe, president of Westmont College. In Compelling Conversations, I engage scholars, leaders, authors, and members of our community in discussions that inform us about essential issues and encourage us to take meaningful action. George, where were you born and raised and what were some of the formative influences on your life as a young man and growing up? I was born in most like Washington. I was really raised in Southern California, San Diego area. I was raised there until ninth grade. And then in ninth grade, I moved to, to stay with my grandparents who were in Amarillo, Texas. Okay. Probably the biggest influence on my life other than my mother was my grandfather. He's a brilliant man, but he never got a college degree. In fact, okay. I don't even know if he got a high school degree, just because you know that's the way it was at those times. Yeah. When he got to got in the Air Force, they saw how smart he was, and they put him working up with computers and stuff. In fact, one of my memories is he had this room that had this homemade computer in it that he had made himself. So that's how intelligent he was. Very soft-spoken, but very, very brilliant. He probably influenced me a lot as far as wanting to see, see intellectual things out, uh, even though I'm in a totally different area. Yeah. That's how powerful intelligence can be. I uh, went to my grandparents and went to college. That, you know, that's why I went to college in Texas rather than California, because you know, if I hadn't made that move there, I might end up somewhere like San Diego State instead of West Texas State University. Now, was uh, that in Amarillo? Is that where you went to school in Amarillo? Yes. Okay. Yes. Am- West Texas State's in a city called Canyon, which is probably about, oh, 12 miles from Amarillo. Okay. So I drove there the first semester, decided I, w- I wanted to go on campus experience. So I went on campus the second semester, but still, my grandparents were, well, at that time, my grandfather had died. My grandmother was close to home, so I could go back home every now and then if I wanted to. Being a first-generation college student, I didn't know much about seeking look at colleges elsewhere. I just thought, you go to your local college. You know, I didn't think about thinking elsewhere. I, I'm pretty sure I could have gotten in some other colleges, but oh, yeah. I, I, I didn't, you know. Wasn't didn't even know to look. George, where did you do your PhD? University of Texas at Austin. Okay. And who was your uh, dissertation advisor there? Norval Glenn. I don't know you know if you've I don't heard know of his him. work, but... Uh, uh, he's, Real famous on his work on the family and stuff like that. What did you write on? See, my dissertation topic was on, it was a sociology of sociology type of dissertation. I was looking at the origins of sociologists and how that impacts the type of sociology that we do. So I had a survey out there and showing that sociologists tend to come from upper middle class backgrounds, they tend to come from the East Coast, they tend to come oh, interesting. from irreligious families and all these things have a factor factors into how they see society. And so sociology looks a certain way that it does because people who come into it have a presupposition that they feed each other since they come to a similar background. Gosh, that's fascinating. I mean, that, actually, I've never heard it put that way, but it makes complete sense that, uh, and you seldom hear about sociologists being studied. Uh, they're usually doing the studying. So right, yeah. Really well, sometimes we need to, uh, understand ourselves. Yeah. And and what thing about me is I violate a lot of those a lot of those norms. I didn't grow up on the East Coast. I didn't grow up in an irreligious household. I didn't grow up in a middle class family. You know, I violate a lot of those norms, which I, I say helps gives me insight that other people miss. What does lead you to your topics? The cultural moment that we're in, your work is just so germane to, to what we're facing. Well, you know, to some degree, I think all, almost all scholars, to some degree, are led to their topics because of their life. And I can't say that that's not the same to me. You know, being a Christian matters. Being African-American matters. You know, all those things matter. Actually, I really wasn't studying race and ethnicity all throughout graduate school. It wasn't a topic of deep interest of mine. I don't even think I took a race and ethnicity course in graduate school or even in undergrad. I'm trying to remember, did I? And I don't think that I did. Nonetheless, I became interested in it because I began to experience real racism 
especially through a relationship, interracial relationship that fell apart because the mom couldn't have her daughter marry, marrying or going with a black guy. And so that's kind of got me really interested in studying race. And, but fortunately, I think from my point of view, I was hurt and, and I was angry. I didn't want to lash out at whites indiscriminately. It got me thinking more, le- less about revenge and more about, can't we really learn how to get along with each other? And that's why I think my take on race is different from a lot of race scholars. Their take on race really is, you know, let's, uh, let's even things up. Let's, let's get our pound in the flesh and that sort of stuff. I don't see that from my point of view. Not that I don't acknowledge, you know, the inequities and inequalities. You know, I think you got to do that before you can move on. So in that way, I'm, I'm like them. But in the solutions, I don't think the solutions can be about trying to get even. So that's, that's how I think I, I have a more unique approach to it. Well, you do. You have an unusual approach, and it, it's quite striking in the conversation itself. And also, in my reading of your work, everybody who's impacted needs to be a part of the solution. If, if you've been a part of the problem in some respect, you you need to be a part of the solution. And I was struck by even the strategies you have for engaging majority culture students as well as uh, students of color. How, how did that, did that evolve over time? Did that insight come to you, you know, in a kind of a moment or what, what were the factors that fed that insight? Yeah, I think it more evolved to come to me in a moment. I don't know if there was a moment where I thought, aha, but yeah. I think just by, by willing to listen, interact, I began to realize certain things were more likely to be successful. And also, when I was in the audience and listening, one of the negative examples was when I was a TA and I was, uh, my job was to sit in the class and take notes so that I can help grade the test and that sort of stuff. And so okay. I was in the class and I looked pretty young then. You know, the students forgot that I, was, that I was a graduate student. They thought I was one of them. So... I really paid attention to when the teacher really came down on white supremacists and the Klan and stuff. And I, I watched how the students just basically did a big eye roll and yawn. I said, that's not the way to get, get through to them. You know, since then, when I try to talk about these issues, I've tried to find ways of talking about it that uh, resonates with students rather than uh, turns them off. Well, I, I mean, one of the things that you mentioned in your neither Jew nor Gentile work is that a professor of color who does have good rapport, or that's my framework of it, able to get along with a broad wealth of students, a broad cross-section of students, really is the most effective. And, and was that a part of this observation? I don't think I was looking for that, but it makes right. sense that I found it, you know. Yeah. It makes perfect sense that I found it. I don't know if I could exa- say precisely the most effective person because I didn't measure that yeah. precisely. I think it's pretty likely that, that they are the most, the ones who can develop a rapport. Yeah. Well, it's, it, I think the reason I resonated so much with it is that was, I'd never thought of my own experience that way, but it immediately resonated as true that who have I been most receptive to uh, in the conversation, faculty of color who actually establish a strong interpersonal relationship with me. They've had the most impact. I'm pretty sure it's true for Christians, Christian campuses. I suspect it's true for on secular campuses as well, but my research is in all secular campuses, so I can't really say anything about yeah. that. But, but given what we know about how you persuade people, you know, I, I suspect it's true. I suspect it's true for convincing people who are not already convinced. You know, certain people come on campus are already convinced about anti-racism or what have you, and you don't have to convince them and uh, they can create these silos. But what you have to do is convince people who are either indifferent or suspicious uh, all this race talk or, or they even care about race talk, but they, they realize anti-racism doesn't work. Those are the ones you have to convince. Having a professor just basically you know, talk to you about how you're part of white supremacy just doesn't work for them. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that's why I think it's very effective. Yeah. And yeah, Love that rapport, those relationships is part of what needs to be done. You are listening to Westmont's Compelling Conversations with President Gail D. Beebe.
George, where, as you look at our cultural moment, and are there signs of hope that uh, inspire you, and, and where do you carry the most concern? Well, I'm an optimistic guy, so I always look for signs of hope, and I, I think they're there. I think more people are talking about it and willing to engage in it. Whether that persists, I think depends on what we do with it. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful for that. I hope to be part of a movement to really try to emerge this sort of third mechanism, third way of doing it. I'm getting connected with some organizations that are, that are going to be very useful for that. I'm hopeful in that sense, but I know it's going to be a lot of hard work. I'm not, I'm optimistic, but I'm not, you know, silly optimistic. Think, hey, we're just going to snap our fingers and it's going to be all good. Yeah. Our Zoom call a week ago, uh, you mentioned your children. Uh, as you look to the generation that comes be behind you, what do you hope for your children's generation? I hope that they can work some of this stuff out in, in a healthy way. Uh, I hope my boys are part of that. Right now, the challenge for me and my wife is to figure out how we can socialize them so they can be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And, you know, and, and of course, there's not a lot of literature out there on how you socialize kids to, in order to deal with collaborative conversations. That, that would be my hope, that, uh, that we start seeing solutions and they start benefiting from those solutions. Well, George, you are a part of the solution, and I'm grateful for your work. Are there any ideas that you'd like to share as we conclude this brief interview? I think we just have to be persistent and do what we can in our corner. West Point is not going to change the whole United States or even just California, but it can, in its own corner, start making changes. Oh, and if enough organizations making changes and approach in a different way, it will get noticed. And now uh, there'll be an alternative to anti-racism out there. And people will then have to uh, step up, take notice, and try to figure out what, what, what to do about it. If we are hoping for some big event and boom, everyone's going to be saying, all right, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go to cloud conversation. That's probably not going to happen. But all of us doing what we can, I think, can eventually uh, create that sort of change. Well, I, I am personally just so grateful for your work. It really has helped me. It's given me a framework of engagement that I find deeply meaningful. And uh, we're actually utilizing your work at Westmont. So thank you for being available now. And I look forward to getting to host you on campus. Well, God bless. Join us next time for another compelling conversation with President Gail D. Beebe.